dear students and teachers, how are you? I hope you all are fine. Previously on our discussion, we have tried to see about mechanical equilibrium. We have defined what equilibrium is. Equilibrium is state of balance. It measures state of balance of a given structure. It's possible to classify equilibrium into two as static equilibrium and dynamic equilibrium. We mainly focus on static equilibrium. And the system that we are going to deal or study can be classified into two as a particle system or mass string system and a rigid body system. We have also tried to classify the conditions of equilibrium into two as the first conditions of equilibrium and the second conditions of equilibrium. The first conditions of equilibrium is all about translational equilibrium and it focuses on the net force to be zero. And for a particle system, the first condition is sufficient condition. Whereas for a rigid body system, we need to apply both conditions. The first condition of equilibrium and the second conditions of equilibrium. The first conditions of equilibrium focus on force, whereas the second conditions of equilibrium focus on moment of force or torque. And we have tried to solve some problems. And today, let's try to discuss about the property of bulk matter. And this is our last topic of grade 11. So unit 8 is all about properties of bulk matter. Under this unit, we need to define terms like bulk matter, deformation, stress, strain, and the like. Okay, we should have to define those basic terms. Then we'll be able to state Hooke's law, Pascal's principle, Bernoulli's principle, Archimedes' principle, and so on. And we are able to solve uh, problems concerning on the law of continuity, Pascal's principle, Archimedes' principle, and so on. So first, let's try to define what bulk matter is. When we mean by bulk matter, it means that it's a matter which consists a number of particles which do have, they do have intermolecular relationship. Suppose if you take just a single particle, but in the case of bulk matter, those particles must be interconnected or they do have chained structure. Such bodies are known to be bulk matter. In this case, we mainly focus on those three, or we might classify bulk matter into three as solid, liquid, and gas. As force is exerted on those bodies or bulk matter, the force may exert a deformation, a different uh, effects on those matter, like it might compress, okay, it might bend, rotate, and the like, or it might deform those bulk matters. First, let's try to see what does it mean by deformation. And deformation is the change of shape or size of a given bulk matter. Usually, you might take a solid body. Due to the force, due to the exerted force, there might be a change of shape or size. And that is what we call deformation. When we mean by shape or size, it might be length. Okay? It might be area. It might be the volume of that bulk matter might be changed from initial to final. So at some state, it might be changed so that the change appears due to the force exerted and such change of shape or size is known to be deformation. And there are two types of deformation we mainly focus, and these are the elastic deformation and the plastic deformation. When we mean by elastic deformation, such deformation appears as the force is exerted to change the shape or size and then released the object regain or restore its original shape or size. If you find such bodies, then it's possible to say elastic deformation. So elastic deformation occurs when the force that caused the change are removed, the bodies go back and regain its initial dimension or its initial length or it might be uh, its initial size. Or it's also possible to say it can be defined as the materials regain or restore their original size after distortion, after distorted. The exerted force is removed, then it's possible to gain the initial shape or size. Such a deformation is known to be elastic deformation. Whereas plastic deformation, even after removal of the exerted force, the body cannot gain its initial shape or size. 
such a deformation is known to be plastic deformation. Actually, depending on the orientation between the force and the cross-sectional area, we can classify deformation into four. So depending on the orientation means the force exerted to that of a cross-sectional area A, it might be perpendicular, parallel, or at some angle. Therefore, depending on the orientation, it's possible to classify deformation into four. The first deformation is tensile deformation, and tensile deformation leads to that of elongation in size. Okay? As you exert a force F onto a cross-sectional area A, there is a perpendicular orientation. The force, perpendicular force exerted on the area A, it leads to that of the elongation, increment in length is known to be tensile deformation. Here you have shear deformation. Shear deformation actually exerted due to the shear force. The shear force is acting parallel to the cross-sectional area. It acts like parallel to the cross-sectional area. If this is a shear force, let's say, or force parallel, force parallel or shear force acting parallel to the cross-sectional area so that it leads to that of bending of objects. So here it leads to that of elongation, but here it leads to that of bending of uh, objects. Whereas torsional deformation is acting along the axis or it's exerted about an axis so that the objects are twisted. Okay? So torsional deformation exerted due to the force acting about an axis and it forms a twisting of objects. Compressional deformation, actually, the force in the cross-sectional area is perpendicular. But in this case, it leads to that of a compression, a shorten in size. It leads to that of a compression, actually. Compressional deformation and tensile deformation tells us that the force is perpendicular to the cross-sectional area. But in this case, tensile deformation leads to that of elongation in size. Compressional deformation leads to that of compression or shortened in size. Then let's try to see about the basic terms used under bulk matter. There are very important terms. And these terms are stress and strain. What do you mean by stress? Well, stress measures the amount of the force exerted on a given cross-sectional area. The force exerted on a given cross-sectional area is known to be stress. So stress mathematically can be expressed as force to that of area and its SI unit is given to be the SI unit of force to that of the SI unit of area. The SI unit of force is Newton, the SI unit of area is meter squared, so Newton per meter squared can be expressed as Pascal in honor of Blaise Pascal. And one Pascal is equivalent to that of one Pascal is equivalent to that of one Newton per meter squared. So stress can further be classified into uh, three, as tensile stress, shear stress, and pressure. Pressure itself can be considered as stress, okay? I hope in your lower grades concept, you have learned that pressure itself is forced out of area. Yes, that's true. Pressure is one form of stress. There is also another form of stress, tensile stress, shear stress, okay? Shear stress is actually main concept, but under that, it's possible to use tensile, shear, and pressure itself can be considered as a stress. Tensile stress can be symbolized by using a Greek letter, sigma, and it is a stress which is exerted due to the perpendicular force component. Perpendicular force to the cross-sectional area leads to that of tensile stress. Previously, we have seen here we do have a force acting perpendicularly upward like this, or it's possible to use downwards, it doesn't matter. So that it leads to that of force perpendicular to that of cross-sectional area, there will be elongation or uh, an increment in length, or in this case, there will be a shortening in length. In either case, the force is acting perpendicular to the cross-sectional area. Such a stress is known to be tensile stress. We call it to be tensile stress. So perpendicular force component to the cross-sectional area is known to be tensile stress. Sometimes it's also known to be axial stress. Shear stress is actually formed due to the shear force, meaning the parallel force component acting along cross-sectional area. 
as a parallel force known to be shear force acting on a given cross-sectional area the stress formed is known to be shear stress and it's symbolized using greek letter tau and at last the well-known concept that you already knew is pressure pressure is also the other forms of stress we usually use pressure for fluids like liquid and gas sometimes it's also possible to use for solids but we use stress mainly for, for broader concepts for all the bulk matters for solid liquid and the gas we use stress therefore pressure itself is expressed as force to that of cross-sectional area and the force is perpendicular to the surface area more of similar to that of tensile stress we use this for more of a liquid and gas therefore so far we have seen three stress tensile stress shear stress and pressure all are considered to be a stress and the other term that we need under bulk matter is strain okay and strain measures the ratio of change of lengths it might be change of area or it might be change of volume to that of the original volume or we can generally say that the change of size to original size is known to be strain we call it to be strain so strain is equal to change of size or original size to that of change of size to that of original size and it's unitless quantity because change of size it might be change of lengths let's say change of lengths to original lengths lengths is measured in meter over meter gives us it's a dimensionless quantity you can eliminate it or it might be change of area to original area which is meter squared over meter squared will be cancelled change of volume to original volume it might be cancelled out so that it is a unitless quantity strain is a pure number and depending on the type of the stress exerted on a given body it's possible to classify strain itself into three previously we have categorized stress into three as tensile stress shear stress and pressure depending on those corresponding stress there will be a strain formed and the strains are also known to be tensile strain tensile stress leads to that of tensile strain shear stress leads to that of shear strain whereas a pressure will exert volume change so that it's known to be volumetric strain tensile strain can be symbolized using a greek letter epsilon and it is the ratio of change of lengths of a given body to that of the original lengths okay here change of lengths to that of original lengths is known to be tensile strain and tensile strain appears due to tensile stress as you exert force perpendicular force to a given cross-sectional area you will form a strain and that strain is known to be tensile strain the other strain is shear strain shear strain can be symbolized using delta and shear stress is a measure of uh, change of angle or you can call it deflection angle previously we have said that shear stress can form a bending of objects as you exert shear force it will lead to that of bending of uh, the bodies those bodies has initial lengths like h let's say this is initial uh, width as these objects tend to bend to some angle there will be an angle phi here we might say angle theta or phi so shear strain measures this angle of deflection tan phi meaning tan phi the opposite this opposite it deflects some angle so it's it can possibly say that change in x you can say change in x when you divide change in x to that of h it gives us tan phi and this is how we determine shear strain okay and at last volumetric strain usually for liquids and gas as you exert pressure pressure is other form of stress as you exert pressure at least to that of change of volume so volumetric strain refers to that of change of volume divided by the original volume suppose here you have a fluid okay as you exert force on this cross-sectional area it might be a piston so that force to area gives us pressure and this pressure will decrease the volume initially this object has its initial volume as it is compressed and down the volume might be changed and the final volume so final volume minus initial volume gives us change of volume 
So the change of volume divided by the initial volume or the original volume gives us the volumetric strain. So, so far we have seen three stress and the corresponding stress leads to that of a corresponding strain. Shear stress to shear strain, uh, tensile stress to tensile strain, and the pressure to that of volumetric strain. And now let's try to see a relation between stress and strain. A stress and strain has a direct proportionality under a given limit, actually. So stress and strain has a direct proportionality. So in your mathematics lesson, stress is proportional to strain. When you are trying to convert it into equal or equa equation, you should have to introduce something constant. Therefore, stress is equal to that of a certain constant k times strain. And that constant k can be mathematically given as the ratio of stress to strain. So the ratio of stress to strain gives us uh, a constant known to be modulus. Okay, it's known to be modulus. So modulus means it measures the ratio of stress to strain, which is a very important term. And depending on the type of stress and strain, we do have also three types of modulus. Here, the SI unit of modulus is actually the SI unit of stress to that of strain. Stress is Pascal or Newton per meter square, whereas strain, the SI unit of strain is, we call it to be dimensionless. Therefore, stress, the SI unit of stress is also the SI unit of the modulus. So it's possible to have Newton per meter squared. Okay, Newton per meter squared is known to be Pascal. Therefore, depending on the type of stress, and the strain, we do have also three modulus. Previously, we have seen, said that there is tensile stress. Tensile stress leads to that of tensile strain. Shear stress to that of shear strain. Pressure to that of volumetric strain. Therefore, shear stress to that of tensile stress gives you a modulus known to be Young's modulus or tensile modulus or modulus of elasticity. Here we do have a tensile modulus. It's also known to be modulus of elasticity or Young's modulus. And Young's modulus is generally given to be the tensile strain. Previously, we have said that tensile stress can be given as the perpendicular force to that of cross-sectional area. And the tensile strain can be represented using epsilon, which gives us change in lengths over original lengths. Therefore, when you are trying to find the modulus, Young's modulus or modulus of elasticity, sometimes you might use E, capital E, for modulus of elasticity, or Y. So if you use Y, or Young's modulus, or E is stress, tensile stress, to tensile strain. So when you are trying to substitute all those values, you are going to determine a very important relation. So Young's modulus, you might use Y, tensile stress to tensile strain, Whereas tensile stress means the perpendicular force to the cross-sectional area, and tensile strain means the change of lengths to original lengths. So when you rearrange those equations, we can have Young's modulus is equal to force times the original lengths over change lengths times cross-sectional area. Under a proportionality limit, under a proportionality limit, meaning there is a limit where stress and strain has a direct or a linear relation. Beyond that, there might be a nonlinear relation. But under proportionality limit, Hooke's law is obeyed. Hooke's law is obeyed or Hooke's law is true. And what does it mean by Hooke's law? Well, on a given structure, it might be a spring. As you exert force on this string or on this object, there will be elongation. This force F has a direct proportionality with that of this extension or elongation, like we can call it change in X or change in L. Therefore, there is equation, a well-known equation, which is stated as F is equal to K times change in X or change in L. We might use change in length as well. This equation is highly correlated with Young's modulus. From this relation, it's possible to find that force F here you have force F, you can express force in terms of change in lengths. So Y times A change in lengths over original lengths. So F is equal to Y times A over change in lengths. There is something constant times this change in lengths, okay? 
The same expression to that of Hooke's law. In Hooke's law, you have used that f is equal to a certain constant k times change in x, or let's say in this case, change in l. Therefore, the same expression appears from Young's expression y times a over original lengths. Let's say that this is a constant k times change in lengths. Therefore, the force f is equal to k times change in lengths. And this k is known to be stiffness, or sometimes known to be Newton's constant, or force constant. And this force constant is related to that of the properties of bulk matter, meaning to the properties of uh, Young's modulus of the substance, the cross-sectional area of a substance, to that of its lengths, original lengths y. So this is known to be stiffness, or force constant, and force constant is related to that of Young's modulus, cross-sectional area over change in lengths. So when you substitute this, instead of this, it's possible to have f is equal to k times change in lengths, which is true for Hooke's law, or which is uh, correlated with that of Hooke's law. Previously, we have seen about modulus of elasticity, or Young's modulus, or we can call it to be tensile modulus. Here we have another modulus known to be shear modulus. Shear modulus appears due to a shear stress and the corresponding strain, shear strain. So shear modulus, also known to be modulus of rigidity, and it's given to be shear stress to that of shear strain. Actually, we should have to focus on the modulus of uh, elasticity on the previous one. Okay, This one just helps you to know that there are different types of modulus, but mainly focus on Young's modulus. Here we have also another modulus known to be bulk modulus. And bulk modulus measures to that of the ratio of pressure to that of the volumetric strain is known to be bulk modulus. And pressure P to that of the volumetric strain means change in volume over the original volume. It's possible to have bulk modulus, shear modulus, and the main modulus we should have to focus on is modulus of elasticity or Young's modulus. Now let's try to see the graphical representation between, between stress and strain. Here you have stress. Stress means force to that of area. We mainly focus on the force. And strain, strain means it's possible to have a tensile strain, change in lengths over original lengths. We mainly focus on the extension or change in lengths. So stress and strain, until it reaches to that of a certain point, Previously, you have stated this point as proportionality limit. There will be a linear relation between stress and strain. Or it's possible to say the force and the extension, they do have a direct relation force, has a direct proportionality to that of extension. You might say change in X or change in L until it reaches to that of a proportionality limit. So let's say that point A is a proportionality limit. And Hooke's law is true under this law, OK, under this concept. If you are further moving beyond this proportionality limit, there will be a relation between stress and strain, but there is a non-linear non relation between stress and strain. So it reaches until uh, point B. And then when we reach at point B, there will be a sudden increment, a sudden increment in elongation, keeping the pressure or keeping the stress constant. And this is known to be yield point. As objects reach at yield point, there will be a sudden increment in strain, keeping the stress constant, or keeping the pressure, keeping the force constant, there will be a sudden increment in uh, lengths. And then, uh, as you increase pressure or strain, furthermore, the object might be broken, or it might be totally deformed. So, at point C is known to be fracture point or rupture point. At that point, a given object will be totally deformed, or it might be break. If, if you take a steel or something, or a spring, if you exert a force, the force has a direct proportionality with the length until it reaches proportionality limit. And then further, you increase the force. The force and the increment, or the change in length, has a nonlinear relation. Until this, nonlinear. Here, we have a linear, then nonlinear. Then, as we reach at yield point, there will be a sudden change of length. It's known to be yield point or elastic limit. Then, 
we do have a fracture point in the total deformation. This is known to be stress to strain diagram. It's a very important diagram. Actually, I just showed you the main points, but, but there are also several points. As you are going to learn in civil engineering, you can see that. Now let's try to solve one simple example. Here it says, when a load of 500 kilograms is hanging from a steel wire of length 3 meter, and cross-sectional area of 0.2 centimeter squared. The wire stress beyond its no-load length if the youngest modulus of, for the wire made of steel is given to be 2 times 10 to the power of 11 Pascal. So what is the change in length, the change in length of the wire beyond its no-load length? So here are the alternatives given. The question asks us that there is a steel, and that steel has a length of 3 meter, uh, or you can say original length. The original length is 3 meter. And its cross-sectional area is found to be 0 0.2 centimeter squared, meaning you should have to convert it into standard unit, 0 0.2 times 10 to the power of minus 4 meter squared. That is the cross-sectional area. Now, we just hung a 500 kilogram body. So far, this is the length with no load. No load is attached to this body or to the steel. And now, let's attach a 500 kilogram load. Here you have a mass M, which is 500 kilogram. As we exert, 500 kilogram, as you exert this load, the original length might be stretched and there will be an increment in length. There will be an increment in length. Let's call it to be changed in length L. So far we have the main length or the original length L naught is to be 3 meter. Now the question is, what is that extension? Or how long does it stretch with this 500 kilogram body? As you attach 500 kilogram, there will be a force exerted downward due to the weight. In that weight, force can be given as mass times gravity. So 500 kilogram times gravity 10 for calculation gives us 5,000 Newton. So 5,000 Newton is exerted on this object. So 5,000 Newton is exerted. The question said that we have equation here previously, Young's modulus using this equation. It's possible to have force F is equal to Y times A, change in length over original length. We are asked to find change in length. Okay? It's possible to find change in length as force times the original length divided by Young's modulus and cross-sectional area. So the change in length can be given as force times the original length divided by Young's modulus or modulus of elasticity times cross-sectional area. The force exerted on this steel wire is due to the load 500 kilogram, which is 5,000 Newton. You can express it to be 5 times 10 to the power of 3 Newton. So put it like 5 times 10 to the power of 3 Newton. This is the force. And the original length is 3 meter divided by the cross-sectional area and the Young's modulus of a steel. The Young's modulus of a steel is given to be or provided to be 2 times 10 to the power of 11. Pascal. So we can substitute it here. 2 times 10 to the power of 11 Pascal times the area, the cross-sectional area is given to be 0 0.2 times 10 to the power of minus 4. Okay, minus 4. So we can multiply this or it's possible to have uh, shift this point and find it to be minus 5. 2 times 10 to the power of minus 5. So when you are trying to multiply all this, you can find the change in length to be 3.75 times 10 to the power of minus 3 meter. 3.75 times the power of times 10 to the power of minus 3 meter. And 10 to the power of minus 3 can be expressed as millimeter, so that it is 3.75 millimeter. This is the change in length or the extension of this body beyond the no load here. There is no load. But after that, there is a load. The length after or beyond no load is to be 3.75 millimeter.
Here you have the answer. It is 3.75 millimeter. I hope you have found a good concept and you have tried to solve the problem with me. And try to solve as many problems as you can. And that's all that I have got for today. Next time we'll try to see about fluids. Generally we'll try to see about fluid mechanics, fluid statics and fluid dynamics. Since then, have a good time. Bye-bye.